My task here is to talk a little bit about the challenges that we were facing when we were implementing uh, a new replacement for the CG miner software, and we were doing it in Rust. Um, essentially, I would like to cover a little bit of the history, also to give some credit to CK for his hard work. Um, so initially, CG miner, as everybody uh, knows it, uh, used to be a CPU miner. That functionality has been removed a long time ago already. But it was at that time when, when it was the CPU, one CPU, one vote thing. And it was really open source. Uh, and you were just running on your own machine. The next stage in the evolvement of, of the software of the CG miner was when GPU mining stepped in. And we started seeing a little bit, a little bit of disappearing of the open source parts of the miner, because in fact, it was still a driver, but it was a driver for a specific hardware, so-called GPUs. And those GPUs actually had special pieces of uh, GPU kernels that some people developed. Some people would open source them, some people would not. And uh, you were pretty much stuck with what it was. The next evolution in the CG miner history is that people started using FPGAs to mine Bitcoin. Um, at that time, this is very similar to the, to the GPU times, where people were developing different bit streams to do the SHA-256 hashing and to find uh, blocks for, for the Bitcoin network. Uh, and again, there were people who were open sourcing their, uh, their IP, their, their knowledge, how to, how to do it on the FPGA. And then there were people who uh, were not. So we again lost a little bit of the open source part of the CG miner. And then eventually, when the ASICs came out, those were already uh, different kinds of devices where um, all these uh, three predecessors were still usually devices connected to your machine. So you still really needed only the CG miner to, to, to run it and you would use your own operating system. But these devices are embedded devices, so basically they, um, they have kind of an architecture like this. You have some, some control board that's running some crippled Linux, what the manufacturers usually do, and then you have a bunch of hashing boards that contain the ASIC chips that do the Bitcoin mining work. Uh, usually, uh, the CPU that's running on the, on the control board also has an FPGA part. So something like you saw in the previous slide for the pure F FPGA mining. But in this case, the FPGA is, is being used to uh, drive the hash boards doing the real-time part because sometimes it's a little bit challenging to, to feed the chips with the, with the new mining work at the right time. So you can write a small code for the FPGA doing it and your, your operating system running on the regular CPU is just making sure it has enough jobs for the FPGA. And this was the case uh, where the manufacturers actually started shifting a little bit of the logic that was supposed to be running in the CG minor part uh, also into the FPGA. Uh, and a very specific example is uh, the very well-known affair of ASIC boost for the S9s, or where basically uh, the FPGA was the thing that was in the way between the hash boards and the CPU in order to enable the, uh, the ASIC boost functionality. So technically, the manufacturer was uh, holding us by the balls, uh, not allowing us to use the ASIC boost, uh, just because the code in this part was just doing the work wrong or intentionally wrong. It was not documented. So technically, you had the CG minor sources, but you couldn't do anything. You would just find out it's generating bad solutions. Um, and then uh, the control board is running some fan that's not very interesting. So, so these parts uh, are the interesting thing that we need to have in the miner in order to, to drive the hashing chips these days. And what I'm trying to say is that the CG miner thing became basically a pile of code that's only a stupid front end for the FPGAs. Obviously, there are some uh, mining devices, they don't have the FPGA and are trying to drive uh, the hash boards only through the UART, which is doable. And then the question is also, do they really publish the sources on time or not? Uh, coming back to, to the ASIC architecture, uh, it also turns out that at this point, you don't need, uh, or the CG miner itself is not enough to run the whole system because it's running some embedded Linux. So you need a bunch of 
uh, drivers, bootloaders, and so on to run it. And these are also closed source, usually. So even though the manufacturers say they're complying with the GPL, if you try to collect all those bits and pieces, uh, what they're providing, it's pretty challenging to actually get it running uh, as a full system image. This only demonstrates uh, a few affairs. Basically, uh, the lack of open source caused affairs like Anbleed, which were some backdoors. We couldn't use the ASIC boost. And what else do we have in those mining devices? We really don't know. So let's do something about it. Obviously, the problem is that we have different kinds of mining devices, but uh, the manufacturers, they usually took the CG miner sources and they would not publish their changes back, which is also a violation of the GPL. Um, there was a tweet from Concolibas who said he basically got uninterested into the, the whole CG miner development after all those forks happened of the CG miner where the manufacturers were not contributing. And basically, at these days, to have some stable code base and have some robust mining stack, which is securing our Bitcoin, is really challenging because there are so many floating copies of the CG miner source, different formatting, different patches. They don't, they're, it's just not possible to have a single code base for, for all the hardware. But uh, we should have it, right? When, when you want to run a full node, we go to GitHub Bitcoin and we download it and we have one source code that's representing uh, the Bitcoin full node. If you want to build an embedded device based on Linux, you go to, to kernel.org, you write your BSPs and you publish it probably. But there's no single place where you can go to get some, some source and build your mining device. So we took the step and started the Brains OS initiative, which is the open source operating system for uh, basically any mining devices. Currently we support the S9s uh, because they're like the most widespread. And obviously the, the last thing that was still missing in the operating system image was the CG miner thing, which we were using the ones that were published a few years ago, basically by Bitmain, but they were not up to date. And what's, what was slowing us down was trying to add new support for new hardware into, into, those, um, and into the code base that's essentially rusted. So we decided to write a new software in Rust. And I want to just uh, share a few experiences with uh, this development. So why did we decide it for Rust? Uh, we have some experience with, uh, with embedded development. Uh, the situation is not very pleasant when you really deal with embedded devices that have some memory met registers and so on. You all know that even the, the current CG minor code base has a lot of race conditions and it's buggy. It just runs by accident, by good timing, basically. You would find cases where you would try to debug the CG minor and you just can't do it because it just, you have to run it because it has specific timings. If you don't, it crashes. So, we chose this language for the memory safety. Uh, usually there's a, sorry, uh, there's a saying, uh, if it compiles in Rust, it runs, it's correct. So you really want to focus on uh, your logical box, but you don't want to really spend your time on sec faults and why you have some race conditions. The compiler just won't let you produce something that has race conditions in it. It's a little bit challenging initially, but it pays off. The second reason why we chose Rust is the wonderful packaging ecosystem. Uh, I don't think uh, there is a compiled language, so strongly typed language today, that, ha that has no runtime. That's an important thing. Rust has no runtime, so it doesn't have some virtual machine or something doing like memory management. Everything is statically compiled. So it's actually much more lightweight than C++ and very suitable for, for embedded devices. At the same time, with Rust, uh, what you get is if something compiles for an embedded device, chances are that you're going to reuse that component also on the server side, which is great, right? Uh, we just don't want to duplicate code. Like, why would I write a, a Stratum v2 code for the server separately and then for the embedded device as well? No, I want to share one code base for testing and so on. Oh, one thing I didn't mention also, um, 
is that the packaging system allows you to use different versions of the same package at the same time. Wonderful thing. So people who are from the C++ or C development who used to use Autocon for lib2 all and all this old mess, uh, can you do it? No, I, I don't think I would be easily able to run like two versions of the same library in my, in my compiled image. Um, last but not least, um, the whole Rust suite also comes with a nice test harness. So, you know, developers don't like to write tests, but, but they should, right? Mm -hmm. Are there any test cases or unit tests in the current CG miner that the manufacturers would contribute so that you can run make tests and you would just see that your S9 is doing what it's supposed to do without network connectivity? No. Uh, probably like a year ago, we've been contacted by Inno and they were asking us if, they could, if we could provide, you know, silicon, sorry, it's a manufacturer of T1s. Um, and they asked us if we could provide them a special mining node so that they could do uh, testing in the factory. And we were like, why don't you actually run the test without the connectivity? You can just calibrate your, you know, they do some uh, bucketing of the chips and stuff like that. But you don't need to connect your miners to the to the pool, you just can make them work on some dummy jobs, obviously, for a little bit of time. Obviously, they wanted some, some reward, but at that time, they were like really heavily developing. So you want to have a solid test base in your project, and that's what you get also with Rust. And the last thing is beautiful. Uh, there are companies already out there, uh, like Microsoft, Facebook, Amazon, others, who are heavily investing into development of uh, uh, Rust. Sorry. And we, we thought it's just a great idea to also you know, choose a technology that may have some, some future. And besides, we're lazy, so we really want to reuse the code. The challenge one was finding people who would be knowledgeable in Rust or who would be willing to learn Rust. Uh, we started this initiative probably like a year ago, I think, last summer, um, trying to discover like what it is to run Rust in a cross-compiled environment like this ARM boards, and if we can do it also on the host at the same time, and, and so on. And we tried also finding people who would be interested. And it was, I mean, we're based in Czech Republic, and the community for Rust is not very big there. I don't know how it's like worldwide, but when you go search online, you would see the community is like really growing and people are really interested. And if somebody is, wants to be uh, like present in the industry and wants to develop new software that, using, that is using some, some type language like, like Rust is, uh, they're usually around, but not with us. Um, so we basically built a team uh, in-house from people who were just interested into it. And it took probably like two to three months to be able to say that we're like productive enough in the, in the code base so that we like generate enough lines of code. Huh. Challenge number three. I skipped the second one. Um, designing the software, uh, you, unless you do some Hello World thing, you come to a point where you have to, you know, divide your <coughs> job, what you're doing in, with the software, into tasks, right? And you have two ways, usually. You, want, you have to do multi-threading, or you could do the async way. Um, multi-threading is something that is established uh, in the industry. Usually, you have libraries to create threads, synchronize them, join them, and so on. This code base is very solid in Rust. However, um, I forgot what it was called, something like problem 10K or something like that. Basically, multi-threading has the problem. It doesn't scale if you're like receiving many connections on the network and so on. And once you start having like a lot of threads in your application, then it starts like really slowing down because thread technically is almost a full task in, in the operating system, just sharing the, the address space. So it becomes very heavy. Um, Whereas with the async approach, uh, we have people around from, from you know, Node.js and they are used to asynchronous programming. So it's easier to find developers who think in the same way. With async programming, uh, you're basically mapping your tasks. So you have a, m tasks that you're mapping to n threads. And that, that is done somewhere in the background by the runtime. So if you choose the right runtime that's uh, suitable for your application, which I'm going to talk about later, um, 
I think async approach uh, pays off on the long run. There is one drawback to the async part, and that is it's a little bit invasive to your software design. So once you start using async, it's going to show up like every, every now and there uh, in your code, and it just starts like really uh, protruding to, to, into the layers. So you have, to, you have to be ready for that, and you have to really rethink some, of, some parts of the design. Um, the challenge was that at the time we made the decision, uh, Rust was not quite there yet with the async uh, framework and with all this stuff. There's a website called areasyncyet.rs, which summarizes the current state. Um, the current Rust uh, nightly, it's the version 1.39, already is almost async. Uh, there are a few things missing. Um, technically, uh, in Rust, if you want to design an interface, it's called a trait. The problem is if some of your methods of the interface are async. This is not possible in, uh, in Rust currently. So this is like one of the limitations. It's limiting a little bit your, your design patterns. But still, uh, it's on the way. There's an RFC for that. But other than that, the standard library already matured enough. Uh, the async keywords are already stable. So we thought it's a good idea to take this path. Uh, this is not a very surprising architecture, right? Uh, on the top, you have the mining pool. Uh, when you design the software, you have to write some front end. Then you have to have some hub that's actually processing the mining jobs, feeding the work to the back ends, which are the hardware. Note that the thing that we're trying to work on is called a job at this stage because it complies with the Stratum protocol, with the protocol. And at this point, it's already formatted into something that uh, the hardware is able to understand. We call it the mining work. Um, when I was speaking at the beginning what the manufacturers were doing, the S9 just moved this into the FPGA. So technically, the FPGA on, on the S9 is translating a Stratum V1 job, JSON pretty much, uh, into something binary that the chips understand. Like, why would you put such logic into uh, a hardware controller? It's, uh, I mean, well, because you, you don't want people to use the features, right? But you can always step in the wires on the chips and see what's happening anyways. So this is the architecture. But also what I'm trying to point um, with the async approach, basically the whole uh, application is just a bunch of pipes. So you have like a bunch of plumbing. They're called channels in, uh, in Rust. Uh, where you're basically just sending objects and you're receiving something asynchronously back. And this is like the whole application. So you have to start thinking about this design pattern like, I have these two components and they need to talk to each other. Well, if that component is actually shared by, by multiple, uh, you know, with multiple other components, uh, you just cannot have some stupid API because you would need to do the locking. And that just leads to bloating your code with logs and so on. It's doable, but you want to think the real-time way. As this is the way it's done usually in real-time um, applications, where you just have channels connecting your tasks, and the tasks are pretty much sleeping, waiting for something to arrive. Nothing surprising, but it's a, a common way how to do it. So. What were the challenges? Essentially, uh, on the embedded part, when we want to do the rest on here, we wanted to be sure that we can easily cross compile uh, on, a, on an ARM board. This is some silings or whatever. So basically any, any cross compile environment. This is very well supported in, in the Rust ecosystem. Basically, it has two parts. You install your compiler, and then you install your target back target backend. Uh, in case your target backend is somehow exotic, for example, has uh, or doesn't have even a C library or things like that, you can define your own target. And it will just still work nicely with, with the whole ecosystem, because now uh, the, the packaging system is able to compile even the core libraries or cross-compile your core libraries for your selected target. Um, second challenge, uh, when, when you do uh, an embedded application, 
Uh, you usually have to face some I.O. registers that are memory mapped, and you need to access them, right? And you want to do it in a safe way. Uh, so we were like researching the space, like how it's, how it's done. Uh, there's a guy, guy called Japarik, and he does a lot of uh, writing. Um, he writes blogs on, uh, on Rust and how to do it in the, in the embedded domain uh, in a safe way. And while researching what he was working on, uh, we discovered that there was a tool called SVD2Rust. And SVD is a standard from the ARM community, from the um, embedded processors, which defines the registers. So basically, like any manufacturer that produces an embedded chip with some peripherals, they should publish an SVD file, which basically describes as a, descri a hardware descriptor of your chip. And with this SVD file, it's usually recognized by different IDEs. And for us, we were able to define our own SVD for our own FPGA code, which we are making open source as well, um, and generated a safe Rust code that allows accessing the registers. Well, you can think like, what is so challenging on accessing registers? I mean, it's a few bytes in the memory. But you want to be safe even on the bit level. So you want, you want to make sure that your application cannot access bits, uh, reserved bits in the, in the I.O. registers that you're not allowed to do, uh, but to access. Uh, if a bit in a specific register is read only, you want to detect cases where the application tries to write them. But technically, since it's, since it's compile time, you already know in compile time that you just try to do something that's not supported. So this is very robust. Second part, at some stage, since these devices are running Linux, um, you have to have some source of interrupts, right? And writing a kernel driver is probably not the right way for this. It's a bit an overkill, because basically, you just map your FPGA part to drive the hash boards, uh, and you just want to get some notifications. There is a wonderful framework in Linux kernel called UIO. So user, it's called user uh, IO. Um, and there's a Rust binding for, for the, this kernel interface. Unfortunately, uh, the UIO interface is not async. <laughs> this is going to be a very uh, common pattern. You find a wonderful library, you want to use it, but it's not async. Well, what happens? Um, there are two ways how to deal with this. Um, even with, with async approach, you can always uh, have um, a runtime framework which you eventually have to use to, to run the whole async application, that is able to dedicate specific threads for, your, for parts of your applications, for, for parts of your application that are not async. Uh, for this specific case where we needed to do the UIO, um, we actually forked the UIO thing and we have implemented uh, an, an async extension because we think it's, it's uh, beneficial for, for the whole ecosystem. So you can take two approaches. You either just take the byte and just implement it yourself with the async part, or uh, you just go around and you just use the uh, non-async way within the async environment. Challenge number four. It's a little bit unordered. Um, when you're new to the ecosystem of Rust, um, you basically uh, feel that the amount of packages that are available, since they're centralized on the craze.io, is so huge that you cannot decide like, which ones are the right ones, which are the industry standard, which ones you want to use. Um, I will just summarize a like, few areas that we made some, decision on, ma made some decisions on, uh, and this may also change. So first thing that you're going to face is logging. Uh, doing the logs right um, is a challenge. Uh, doing them in a synchronous way is a challenge. Doing them in a, uh, in a structured way is also a challenge. So we found a framework called SLOG, which pretty much fulfills all these criteria and seems to be well supported within the community. Second part is error handling. Unfortunately, this thing is still open because there's a lot of development in, in Rust currently for the error handling part. Uh, Obviously, the standard library has some approach uh, to deal with the errors, but it's not very comfortable. Uh, we found two crates. Um, they're going to be posted 
in the notes uh, that I'm going to publish to the Slack channel. Um, that seem to be suitable. One of them is called failure, uh, and the other one call, is called Saifu. We're currently on the failure part. Um, then, uh, because we're dealing with Bitcoin mining, we need some Bitcoin primitives, right? Doing the SHA verification and so on. Um, we found a, a wonderful uh, library called uh, Bitcoin Hashes. It's the Rust Bitcoin Initiative by Andrew. I don't know if he's around. Uh, so we are using that one, considering it's stable and mature and it's very well written. Um, then you need to uh, communicate on the network level and you need some serialization uh, framework. Uh, currently, it looks like the standard and Rust is called Serde, which allows you to either use some existing backends or formats like JSON, or you can write on your, your own backends. Very comfortable. The only limitation is that the way it works is that you're mapping your own model um, of objects into Serde's model and then is the serialization format. The problem is that sometimes if your model has uh, types that are not easily mappable into the service model, you're going to hit the wall a little bit. But there are ways around it. And last, uh, an important thing, is to choose the async framework. Um, currently, the standard is Tokyo. The problem with Tokyo is that it used to be, or it still is, Kind of the, the, the stable release of Tokyo is not compatible with the latest uh, Rust, <laughs> but they just made an alpha a few weeks ago with the new async uh, uh, support already. Uh, so things are already changing, and we still believe this is the right way. Because Tokyo is using other crates like MIO that do the abstraction for your operating system when, when you talk to specific devices, sockets, and so on, like networking stuff. Yeah, everything that I'm mentioning here is open source. Um, and these are like third party packages. That, that this was a challenge, like choosing the right way in the ecosystem, like what, it, what is the right uh, approach to, to do. Um, I pretty much covered most of these things. Uh, but just to summarize it, basically, we, we're running the Rust, Rust code on the ARM CPU. We have some FPGA part that's running some really lightweight um, driver to talk to the hash boards. And the Rust is just feeding this part with, with the work, not jobs. Yes. Well, that's uh, one of the reasons why we did it. Um, technically, we could have written the Rust code for, for the current crappy uh, uh, you know, S9 uh, for FPGA uh, bitstream. But it would be a waste of time because we want to support multiple devices. Uh, and th this would be just, I mean, their interface is proprietary and it's like even undocumented. Um, this is a little bit of timeline, like what we, where we are currently. Um, so basically, uh, we pretty much committed to have uh, the prototype uh, ready by end of October. It's currently running. Um, I'm going to show a little bit after this. Uh, and then we want to move to the MVP stage. The MVP stage is very important because we would, we would like to match the current features of CG Miner. The current, the current Rust implementation is just bare Miner. It has no API, it has no fan control, it has fixed clock, but it supports uh, NS9 and, and block eruptor. If, if uh, anybody remembers uh, these, any time ago, they're pretty expensive, like $60 now. Uh, we wanted to have this uh, to simplify the development because the backend part of the miner uh, should be very thin, right? So you should be able to write all your networking code and on your, all your job processing logic um, with anything else than the physical mining hardware. But you need something because doing a CPU mining, even on difficulty one, is very challenging. It's take, it takes time and you just waste your time. Obviously, you can test against rec test, but it's not like exactly what you want. Um, the new miner uh, supports only the new mining protocol for a very good reason. We just want to get rid of the JSON stratum protocol. It's very inefficient and basically it's slowing down quite a few things. But in order to, to do the switch, we also wrote uh, a small simulator um, I should probably have it like this, a stratum simulator. 
It implements V1 and V2. It can simulate a pool and a mining device. Uh, our plan is to add uh, a proxy as well to simulate different scenarios where you're trying to translate between the protocols. Um, yeah, and this is the last part of the package, which is uh, a stratum proxy written in Rust, which is a very simple proxy currently being able to translate a V2 to V1 so that you can connect the, the miner to an actual pool. And now it's showtime, but I was, uh, I was not sure if, uh, let's see if we have connectivity. The problem is that the university is filtering stratum. I tried uh, 3333. Uh, <laughs> Why? Well, maybe it's for a good reason. Uh, well, I'm through, through VPN, so it, uh, but I, I didn't want to specifically show this through VPN because I want to use our public uh, endpoint that, uh, that, that already runs. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. It's not production, it's, it's a testing. It's a testing. Actually, some guys are sending 200 petahash uh, to that testing node right now, but not through the protocol. I just found out in the morning, I was like, why do they use? Because at some point, this is exactly what the manufacturers do. Like, you just give them a URL, but you cannot get rid of it anymore. Like, even the port that I'm going to show here, it's, uh, on, is it? No, it's not readable, sorry. Ayana, do uh, this is where I want it to be. Uh, so the three 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 six, which we never give to, we never gave it to anybody. Some some somebody's hitting it already, uh, because I, I shut down the regular JSON stratum and I put this one there. I just found out in the morning it's uh, being somehow used a little bit, but. Um, I wanted to find out if I have connectivity. I have to put this down. Okay, uh, this is through my cell phone. It should. Were we lucky to find a, a share? Not yet. Oh, there you go. Um, even the eruptor uh, currently, uh, even if you started on uh, difficulty one, which is the node is specifically configured to that, but in order to prevent some DDoS attacks, it, it raises the difficulty to 512 almost immediately. So now you're actually seeing the hash rate, but it's going down because at some point, uh, the pool already changed the difficulty to, this is 512, so we would wait like an hour to find a share. Um, yeah. How can you tell that I'm not making this up? Um, it's difficult to, uh, to trust me. Um, maybe you can verify yourself when you look into the sources. Um, the plan is that we would be releasing the sources uh, in Honey Badger because we want to. St we still want to do a few changes uh, in the protocol and like to clean things up. But if anybody is interested already here, I'll be around and I can give you an SD card uh, with uh, the copy of the sources. Um, the whole ecosystem is actually a monorepo, and in order to explain like how we came up with the idea of the monorepo, it started like this. We, ha we had the Brains OS project at some point, and it was just a meta project running a build for OpenWRT, because Brains OS is an OpenWRT distro, pretty much. And then we had like external projects. But at some point, we were like, OK, we're going to write a new mining software. And it's very tightly bound to, to what you have for the FPGAs and so on. So we're going to put it. Shall we have a separate repository? We were like, OK, no. Let's add this mining software to the Brains OS. So we started writing the mining software. And we found out that we would not be able to actually use, uh, or use just third party libraries. And there would be like new crates created by us. But they would not be like mining specific like the mining protocol that you want to use also on the server side and so on. So you're like, okay, let's, let's create a Rust monorepo. So it would be like one place to go for our open source Rust code. And then you we were thinking, okay, so we would have like BrainSOS separately and then another repository with everything else that is Rust. But what if we come up with the idea of a Python um, simulator? Where do we put it? Separately into, into the ecosystem. 
So then we had the idea, OK, let's have um, a, an open source monorepo that contains all the code that we publish. And it should make sure that the changes are consistent. So that is the idea. Um, that is it for me for now. Uh, if you have any questions. OK. Um, you said that you will have um, a proxy between Stratum v1 and v2. Um, will you support um, better hash as well? So will there be a proxy between v1 and better hash or v2 and better hash? Um, this is a heated, th heated thing. Sorry, I didn't have a mic for, for the last part. but. Um, we're actually having Matt Corello working with us in Prague uh, after Honey Badger for a week. And he himself expressed uh, that it is not a good idea for BetterHash to becoming an industry standard. Uh, you can search her, his tweets or reactions. We actually made the announcement about the Stratum V2 a month ago, uh, somewhere in Miami, I think. Um, so I think there will be no need for, uh, for this kind of thing to happen. Uh, what is interesting part, and I didn't want to cover the protocol thing here, but the protocol itself is an interesting piece of engineering work because uh, it is binary. It tries to solve the problem with the security that Stratum has. So it has some parts for signing. Uh, the protocol is not finished. It is in the form of the draft that we should have also published at the Honey Badger time. Um, and it is called to the community to actually look into it and try to figure out different things that we have to deal with. Um, Obviously, the, the benefit of better hash is the work selection part. But the way it's done in better hash currently is not safe for the pool, because the pool has to trust whatever you're submitting to the pool. Uh, so in uh, Stratum v2, we have a similar mechanism that achieves a similar thing. So basically, you can do your own work selection locally, but it has to be approved by the pool. So it's safe also for the pool and for the accounting reasons. So there will be no, no translation. Um, I don't think there will be a need to do that. Um, I, I guess it's kind of obvious, but uh, in terms of hash rate, is it comparable to the, to the closed source? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, on the S9s, so with the same clock setting, we're achieving the same numbers. I mean, there's no. Actually, uh, I ran the. What is it? What is it? Yeah. It sounds a bit surprising, actually. Um, no actually, uh, it is. Um, at some point, oh, I didn't talk about a very important part of, of the development, and that was the analysis and reverse engineering of the S9s. It was a disaster, because there are bugs even in the chips. And, and the bugs are, for example, of the kind that you, you know there's a difficulty register in the chip. But if your difficulty is not aligned to 8 bits, uh, the chip, uh, the compare circuitry uh, works in some reverse way. So basically, you're just the chip is dropping results that are valid. So things like this that you should know somehow. Um, obviously, there's no specs for the chip, so we're still assuming. And at some point, we were thinking that um, the FPGA from S9s is actually hiding uh, duplicate results. Uh, what happens if, you, if, you, if the hash boards are giving you duplicate results? It usually means that they're working on, on a work that has been already you know, assigned and, res uh, and the whole non-space has been exhausted. But the chips have, have nothing to do. So they're just you know, doing the same job on the, on the same work. So wasting energy. So I was kind of hoping that we would find something like this, that you would have a lot of duplicate, duplicate results. But it, unfortunately, it's, it's not the case. So the only finding was obviously the ASIC boost when we published the paper like that it actually works, but the FPGA from, from, from Bitman is actually disabling that feature, or when you enable it, you're just getting false results. So you get the same numbers to, to respond. Okay. <laughs>